Hi, my name is Shanda Rule. I'm a singer, storyteller, joy spreader, and host of the Courageous Voice podcast. The Courageous Voice podcast gathers and shares stories from artistic folks around the world and their journeys through fear, courageousness, and creativity. Join us and get inspired with me as we chat about learning to befriend and walk with and past our fears to share our voices courageously with the world. Hello and welcome to the Courageous Voice podcast. Welcome back. This is your host, Shanda Rule. I'm so happy to be here with you all. I hope you're enjoying the content this season in season two. And today I am delighted to introduce my guest, Natasha Robinson Esquire. Uh, welcome, Natasha. You for having me, friend. Yes, I am so excited. Listen, Natasha and I are church friends from back in the day. And she is moving and shaking and doing some amazing work in this universe. <laughs> and I definitely was so excited to have her on the podcast. I want to do a quick introduction. I'm going to tell you if I'm allowed. I have a basic introduction that I'm sure you're using all the time, but I saw something so beautiful that you wrote. And so I want to, if it's okay, if not, we do that. what you feel led to do. <laughs> and the doctor to be here, you go right on it here. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. So Natasha is a criminal defense attorney. She's a public defender, a professor, a writer, an educator, a social justice activist. She's a speaker. She's a big sister and a mommy. She has created a beautiful online platform called Legalese Please that empowers the development of the comprehension of the law through liberating language. And I love this because I am so bad with law. But listen, Natasha is a fellow Aquarian, yeah. as I am myself. And you, know, you wrote the most amazing Hello, This Is Me on your birthday. Can I mm -hmm. share that? Oh, my you God. I, love, I right. love this. First of all, before, before you talk about yourself, you say celebrate with me. And this is something that I've noticed in your writings about celebrating one another. So I'm going to say that. Celebrate with me. Natasha describes herself as a Black woman, a daughter, sister, cousin, mother, soror, and friend, an Aberisha, a lover of all things HGTV, Golden Girls, and international travel. She loves to read, smell good candles, wash in sugar scrubs. Yes. She's an entrepreneur, an evolution, an educator, and a maker of excellence and errors. She has a ridiculous sense of humor, and she can cry her eyes out. She can conduct choirs and still do the percolator. <laughs> she embraces all of her love languages. She's healing, she's aware, and she's here. Ah, oh my goodness. I love everything about this. Thank you. Everything. And usually I jump right into how people are moving externally in the world, and now I feel like Hmm. I want to ask something more from the internal to the external. So okay. I love how you're saying you're embracing all your love languages. And these are the five love languages that people are talking about. They are. And I have a six. Okay. All right. Okay. Let's go through the love languages. If there's anyone who doesn't know the love languages, and I always forget one, right? There's loving through touch, through, through gifts, through mm -hmm. affirmation, mm -hmm. through acts of service. Mm -hmm. And there's one more. Uh, but my sixth love language is cussing. Okay. Okay. Do you know? I found go put it on a t-shirt. Yeah, so that do that. People understand what I'm saying when I mean that. Oh, quality time. Quality. I didn't say that. Quality yeah, time. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So they are words of affirmation, quality time, physical touch, acts of service, receiving gifts. Uh -huh. And the ideology behind it, for those who do not know, is it's saying when you love someone, this is the language, quote unquote, 
the lexicon, the words, the actions in which you use to convey how you want to be loved or how you love. Mm-hmm. And it can be one of them. It could be a multitude of them. I have added a sixth love language, which is cussing. Cussing is my love language. <laughs> um, and so, of course, while I can do it, I do not always do it because I am respectful of the spaces that I am in. But just know in the back of your head, I'm having an entire conversation that you may never hear. <laughs> oh, my God. Right? And so then this is good because if you do hear it, you know that you are loved. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I can love you and still not do it. Uh, okay. But it is based upon the consent. It's based upon the respect for the person that I have. So let's say I love my mommy very, very, very much. With certain exceptions, if I am quoting something or if I'm really, really passionate or upset, she will allow it. But I don't just come on and be like, hey, B, I love you. You know, it's, it's not that. Of course. Because that will be the ending times of not the right. Because I would be knocked into the grave. <laughs> oh, my God. Let's talk about the space of healing. I feel that where my healing has come from is the ability to love every iteration of who I am and who mm. I have been. Wow. That takes a lot of work. That does take a lot of work. Because we (laughs) live in a space and a place where you have some of us who have been told who have received the conditioning, if you will, explicit Mm -hmm. or otherwise, to not completely acknowledge or recognize who you have been. Sometimes we even hear it in scripture where it's like, don't remember the past. I'm doing a new thing. And the thing is, is that in my healing, I heal best when I am most truthful. It does not mean telling all of my business, but what it does mean is embracing all of the iterations that I have lived through to get to who I am and to offer retroactively the love, the grace, and support that I felt I was not getting. It does not Mm -hmm. mean that I wasn't getting it. When you're talking about language, I was not getting it in a way that I recognized. Okay. And so what I had to do was I had to go back and be my own teacher, my Mm -hmm. own student, my own mother, my Mm -hmm. own best friend. Okay. And to bring all of those iterations to the present and embody it and integrate it and say, we are okay. 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 I read your piece on Medium, a salute to Judge Kentucky Brown Jackson and my sisters. And I'm wondering, is this what you're talking about? Because you were talking about your experiences taking the bar at 25, passing the bar at 25, and then going into this legal arena and how you were treated. And is this what you mean about relearning, like re-educating yourself? So it's a bold and. It okay. Is, it's a saying, cold for moment where you're moving forward and then you're looking back to retrieve what you need to go forward. Mm -hmm. So what that means for me to address the Kintanji thing is that I realized that there have been specific place markers where I realized that although I was still moving forward, I was bringing an unhealed version. Mm. Okay. And the, it was a productive version, but it was not a healed version. Because I never stopped long enough to take into consideration what was happening. And so it wasn't until I got older that I looked back like, wow, that was really traumatic. But I didn't have the language for it at that time. I only had the experience. And so passing the bar 25, one of the things that I am healing from is the existence and impact of rubrics. Hmm of how we are always being, um, not aligned, but how we are always juxtaposed against a rubric. So we have us, and then we have this rubric that says, okay, if you are successful in life, these are the indicators or the metrics to let you know you're successful. Are you married? Are you happily married? Do you have children? 
are those children without any type of deficiencies or disabilities? Are you working? And it just keeps moving. Mm -hmm. um, and rubrics will be like, okay, you're at a beginning stage, you're at an emerging stage, you are at a mastery. And the thing is, I would like to help with the rubrics. How do I feel about me? Hmm. The recognition of knowing that everybody in my space was not in my corner. Mm. That there were those who may attach themselves to me for the purpose of riding to a particular destination without me acknowledging it. Mm. What does it look like and feel like to trust myself? Mm -hmm. To not have to go outside of me and always get affirmation mm -hmm. or advice or confirmation. And that's fine. As long as I see my advice first. Hmm. And in order for me to do that, I had to realize that although I was getting information from a wonderful source, it was a source that had not yet addressed some things that we couldn't even process. And when I say hmm. we are, I'm talking about me. Okay. So when I was looking at just Kentaji Jackson, there were two things that were going on. One is, what does she represent at this point in our life? And then secondly, who am I to be able to be confident enough to take my thoughts to words on paper? Hmm. Because I don't have to wait. We don't have to wait for anyone to acknowledge us in different creative iterations, singing writing, dancing, poetry, uh, uh, painting. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we look to someone to say, well, I will only do it officially if you tell me I can do it. And I wouldn't wait for that anymore. So was there something that pushed you to this point? Was there something that happened, some events? When I gave birth to my daughter, hmm. who was almost six, simultaneously she was giving birth to me. Hmm. So there was a, a figurative, not a literal transition, if you will, a, a, a death uh, a ending, a conclusion of who I had been okay. and who I was now. And that who I am now is not solely dependent upon me being a mother. That's the outcome, but the process is the birthing of knowing who I really am. And she was the conduit okay. for that. Okay, And even though people do not physically have to give birth, so I'm not ascribing giving birth to only uh, people who present as women or who identify as women. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about how everyone in the universe can give birth to something. Mm -hmm. It may be an idea. It may be a business. Okay. It may be a child. It may be a community. It's, it's whatever. We're all creatives and... Giving birth to her in 2017 and then the pandemic in 2020 mm. were two lifelong markers that I can say I got really still and really clear about who I am and who I am not. I'm wondering if you could share a few practices with people, like if you had a journaling practice, an authenticity practice, or community prayer, meditation. Well, the foundation is that in the recognition of the healing that I needed to undergo, what I came to realize was I was authentic even in my unhealed spaces. So my authenticity is not dependent upon, in my opinion, my completed healing. Hmm. Okay. The healing helps me reveal more of the authenticity. Okay. But I was authentic in every iteration mm -hmm. because that's what I knew. Okay. So some of the practices have been, I journal and I also will do voice notes and I also will go in my phone. I have probably about 4,000. Um, I really could write several books because when I think about something, I start a new memo. Okay. And I'm sitting and I'm just typing as it comes out. I don't edit it. I don't redact it. I let it flow as it comes to me, and I will come back to it later. Um, curated conversations hmm. have helped uh, because, as I said earlier, 
everyone in my space was not in my corner. And what I mean by that is you can have a whole bunch of people around you, Mm -hmm. but if they do not support you unconditionally, if they do not love you enough to celebrate you consistently and also call you on your BS, (laughs) you can tell the difference. Yes, people. You want people who can hold you in a space of love, which by definition is also accountability. Mm. Um, so me journaling, me putting notes in my phone, having uh, courageous and confidential conversations, okay. therapy, things that my daughter has said to me, which I'll give an example. When I grew up, I was a perfectionist. Everything had to be a particular way. And the reason why I had that was because I was fearful of the outcomes and the consequences if I didn't do something with perfection. And so one day I was saying something to my daughter and the way that she looked, she was saying something to the effect of, Mommy, you are not being kind to me. I will get it done as I get it done. She's, she's definitely a returned ancestor. She is five one on 86, <laughs> let me tell you. And she is able to slip into these moments where if I am hurried, I hear what she's saying, but I'm not listening. And on this particular space and date, I heard and listened to what she said. And what she was saying was, is that I may have come through you, but I'm not you. Hmm. You no longer have to be a perfectionist. While you are perfect in who you are, you do not have to be perfect in what you do. Hmm. And uh, she is my mirror as I am hers. And so when she was saying back to me things that I had said, I heard them differently. Okay. And so she has been, uh, without, you know, adulting her, she has been an accountability partner without her knowing it. Mm-hmm. That's what these little ones are. So all of that spirituality, of course, which means, and this is where 2020 came in very importantly, which is we didn't have any more distractions. We couldn't just say, well, I'm going to go over here and deal with that and I'll deal with this later. It was everyone, the entire world was sequestered, mm-hmm. was staying at home. And that is when I begin to think about what are the ideals to which I hold? Hmm. Do I still believe them? Mm -hmm. Why do I believe them? Who taught me that? Why do I believe that? And if I don't want to believe that anymore, what is now my new ethos? What is Mm -hmm. my new belief? And I found out there were some things I was just holding on to because I felt I should hold on to them. Um, Some things that I could love people who gave them to me. And respectfully disagree and say, that doesn't work for me anymore. Mm -hmm. Or that never worked. Yeah, I hear that. I know I got lots of therapy during the lockdown, lots of journaling, lots of writing, lots of creative work done. So so I hear you. So you passed the bar at 25 and then you're working as... one time, one time, it's a celebration for me because of the fact I didn't have money to even apply to take the exam. So it was, I only got one time. Okay. Okay. Uh, And it is a very traumatic experience because within two, well, three days, really. But the last two days are in succession, not the first day. The first day, you have to take a professional responsibility exam, Uh which think of ethics, where they give you a whole bunch of fat patterns. You're like, okay, yes, I would do that. No, I wouldn't recommend that. And then the last two days in succession, the first day for me was taking 200 multiple choice exam questions. And then the second day was out of 30 essay questions, me picking 15 to 17. Oh my God. And writing on that. And you don't know what you're going to be asked. You just know the subject areas, but they don't give you areas and say, this is the contracts question. This is a criminal law question. You had to figure it out. Mm-hmm. 
I, I can't even imagine. But I've heard, I know people that have been through this process. So, so you pass the bar, you start working, and then there's a shift at a certain point. There's a shift um, into education. And so this is, it's so funny because I feel like I've witnessed all this just, you know, through Facebook. So what made you decide to switch? Because you first were at Chicago Public Schools. You didn't go right to, to um, higher ed. You were in high school, right? Or did it go the other way? I was. So I started with the law office of Cook County Public Defender, and I was there for 12 and a half years. So I represented people who were charged with anywhere from speeding and trespassing all the way to first degree murder. Mm, okay. And the difference between a public defender and a hired attorney is that the latter is hired. We okay. are appointed to all cases. We don't have any selection of who we get to represent. It is only if there is a conflict of interest or if the client says, I'm going to hire someone else. That is when we are off the case. Okay. So when I was a public defender for 12 and a half years, I started to see different trends. The first trend that I saw was my clients were getting younger and younger in age, mm. but they were being charged with more adult offenses. Okay. So they could be 12, but they would be tried as an adult. At 12? Yes. Oh, my God. Okay. Because at that time in the state of Illinois, the prosecutors could recommend that juveniles be charged as adults if the crimes were very egregious, if, you know, there was a lot of discretion. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't every juvenile, but it was a juvenile, usually if it was a crime of violence or, you know, if they were repeat offenders or especially if uh, it was like a press case or something like that. So that's the first trend that I saw. The second trend that I saw was for non-juvenile offenders. So we're talking about adults now. I would notice is whether or not they were in custody when I would review their confession or statement cases with them, most of them could not literally read what they were accused of writing. Okay, wow. And for those that did understand how to read, they could not explain back to me what legal rights they had surrendered hmm. in exchange for the statement. And so okay. I thought that if I left the courtroom and went into the classroom, I could be proactive in giving that information and not have that information solely relegated to you having to be a victim or witness or defendant. Oh, wow. Because you having a court case is too late for you to learn about mm -hmm. the criminal legal system in the United States. And I felt I could also break up the system by educate. So mm -hmm. I went to Chicago Public Schools and I taught for six years, two years on the South Side and four years on the West Side. And let's be clear, I was not a parent yet. Okay. And my salary was split or it decreased at least 40%. And so certain sacrifices were made. The house that I'm in right now, I leased it to someone so they could live here. And then I had to move into the city to be a city employee until okay. I left because that's when I became pregnant. And so okay. I could not continue to teach at CPS because I felt my daughter deserved a childhood home. So okay. I had to quit that job. I moved back out of here with my daughter, which meant I had to find another job. And that is how I got into higher education. I saw an advertisement on one of those job sites and uh, I applied. And my first, my part in one of that interview, I remember sitting in the parking lot of a grocery store in my car having this interview on the phone. Mm. Because I was okay. just like, eh. I'm going to find something, but, you know, I will find this because this is not going to be able to supplement my current lifestyle, especially with a baby. Okay. And they called me back for the second interview, and I spent all day there meeting different people, and I had to teach a class. Okay. And that's when they called me and told me I had uh, gotten a job. Wow. And so then I was there for four years. Okay. I was not. Okay. I thought you were still there. 
No, I'm not there. I am working for myself. You are completely working for yourself. So I am loving this journey. And I think this is really interesting for people to hear and connect these dots, especially for, I mean, there's so many people that want to start their own thing. So I want to talk about entrepreneurship. But before we talk about Illegalese, please, I want to know about this process, this shift now to working for yourself. Like what's going on for you while you're doing that? Because it sounds to me like you're somebody that is running on what's important to you, your truth and your passion. And that's number one. You're taking these huge pay cuts to educate people. It's, it's amazing work. So now there's this shift. Okay, so yeah. just tell us about the shift and how you did it, everything. <laughs> um, well, I could start by saying uh, uh, I'm a little bit different. I'm wired a little bit different. I am not a risk taker, except when I am. And uh, (laughs) when it comes to certain things, I know instinctively, this is what I'm going to do. I don't care if I'm supported. I don't care if I'm understood. This is what I'm going to do. Okay. Um, When it comes to my career, if you ask some of my colleagues as well as those who are close to me, they like, you doing what? And I wouldn't publicize it until after I'd done it. Okay. Because I knew at the time it's still healing that my actions were dependent upon my affirmation. Hmm. So I if it didn't give me affirmation, I wouldn't do it. Okay, wait a minute. Can you say that again one more time about the affirmation? I, I said that I did not publicize my decisions because at one point my actions were dependent upon my affirmation. Mm. So, so once I continue to heal through that, every career decision that I make, it ultimately is because of my intuition. Hmm. Okay. And sometimes planning. Not all the time. So, like, when I left the public defender's office, I had planned for that. Okay. As best I could. When I left CPS, Chicago Public Schools, that was a little less planned. When I left my higher educational position, that was even less. Okay. But as the planning decreased, the creativity and the belief in myself increased. Okay. That's the first thing. The second thing that I am learning, because I am still fresh into this journey, this leg of the journey, is that creativity is not automatically equivalent to monetary you can be creative all you want but that does not automatically mean that you are going to be able to monetize mm-hmm. exactly. creativity and sometimes you have to do a i have to do what i have to do until i can do what i want to do and so then as you decrease one you increase another one because everyone is not able to you know we say oh write the book quit your job start the business yeah, yeah, yeah. But what we don't talk about is the Exactly. We don't talk about the And yes. a lot of times we don't talk about the ever-ending dance between joy and pain. Hmm. Mm-hmm. We don't talk about how in some iterations, some lifetimes, if you spread all your bills out, you could make a tablecloth. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> because you're like, I understand what I'm called to do. I understand what I need to do. But what about the in-between? Yeah. No one really talks about what happens where you have to come and ask someone. I know that I have all of these degrees or I know I have all of these experiences. Can I borrow $20 from you? <laughs> oh, yes. Because oh I need to get from point A to point B to steal. Yeah. Push the business. And you know why we don't talk about that? Because we are enshrouded in shame. Did we think our failures mean bad choice? We said means we are mistakes. Exactly. We make mistakes, which is often associated with guilt. Shame is saying, I am a mistake. This is so and important. It's so a real thing. Yes. You're saying up. It is a thinking through, am I good enough? Mm. make am i worthy of my price point 
Mm. Who people believe in me. I've had Mm-mm. people ask me legal advice all the time, and when I'm just giving it to them, because again, the conditioning is all your gifts come from the divine. And so you are just to let it flow through you, but you don't take any credit. Mm. So are you on your own right now? I just, I, I, I do a lot of reflection. And I am doing it by myself and I'm not. And here's where I say I'm not because all of the creative side for establishing the business came from and through my ancestral connections. Like I was asleep and I woke up and it it was like a download. I can only explain like I feel it. Mm. An audio saying, this is going to be your logo. This is going to be the name. This is when you need to start it. This is what you need to do. And so January 1st, 2023 was the first time since I have been an adult. So that's, what, 1992. This year is the first time I have ever not worked for anybody. Okay. Congratulations. Do it. Do the thing. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So this is funny that you said your logo. I'm so curious about your logo. I could have sworn that it reminds me of an adinkra symbol, but I couldn't find it. Because it it is. It is the adinkra symbol that stands for continual knowledge. Ah, okay, Um, okay. And so when I created the name Legalese Please, the reason why I created that was because I have one communal ancestor. We are not related by blood. And when we went to our church, she would always ask me a question whether she thought I knew it or not. And so she would ask me the question and I would give her the answer. And she said, they go legalese. Really? Okay. okay. And I never thought about that for 20 years until I was woken up and I was given the name of this business. That's the first reason. The second reason is, as I said before, alluded to before, when we are learning about the law, usually it is in times of chaos. Mm, exactly. Never times of peace. No mm-hmm. one ever wakes up and said, I can't wait to call my lawyer. No one does that. And so I wanted there to be an ease into how we understand and how we learn. Because if you think about it, your best teachers have always been people with whom you felt comfortable. It wasn't that they may have been very intelligent. They may have been. But the places where we thrive are in places where we feel comfort. And so I wanted to create a community that talked about the ease of learning difficult topics Hmm. and to do it in a free space. So ease is actually an acronym. It stands for education, accessibility, zeal, and ease. Oh, I love it. I love it. I love you put the zeal in. (laughs) Yes, I I was like, ooh, zeal, zealous, yes. Because usually when you hear zealot, it has a different connotation. Mm -hmm. Um, but the uh, Dinkra symbol is, uh, it's, it's pronounced Niya Oni. Okay. Niya Oni. And the translation literally means he who does not know. Mm. Okay. And it is an Dinkra symbol that talks about the commitment to lifelong learning. Okay. And so I chose that symbol to say that the process of lifelong learning also includes the learning about law Mm -hmm. and that Mm -hmm. you were going to learn about law in a way that provided ease, in a way that provided accessibility, and in a space that is not going to condone shame. Because if you feel bad about what you're learning or if you feel bad because you don't know it, then that can impede and impact what it is that you actually learn. Okay. I love this. And I am excited to see how it develops, especially your community. I know you have this online community. And I'm seeing that you are doing a partnership with Core TV on a regular basis. Now, that is probably one of the most surprising things. The very first time I was on Core TV was the same time I launched my business. 
Look at that. It was the same day. I was on Court TV first, and then I had a business launch online party afterwards. Wow. And I did that on purpose. Because I'm Mm. I'm like, now I may not always be a risk taker, but I promise you, I'm a strategist. Okay. I, I definitely think about things and where they could end up. I want to shout out my friend and what, who I call my sister in the law, April Prayer. She either emailed me or texted me. I want to say she texted me, and it was something along the lines of, hey, you want to be on TV? <laughs> and so what she did was she put me in contact with the producers of Court TV. Now, I didn't have to do any tryout. I did not have to do a screen test. None of that. It was, this is how you log on. This this is what we're going to be talking about, the cases, but you don't, you don't ever know the questions until they are asked. And it was, it was like, okay, here we go. Wow. And I was like, oh my gosh. And it wasn't until later that I was like, I I was on national television. Look at that. Don't you yes, break this me. That's where the celebration comes in. If we get so, so busy getting to a destination and we don't look back and honor the yes. process, yes. you don't have to like everything about the process, but at least honor the process that you went through and that you were on. And for me, me being on national television all the time. Mm. It, I would have never, ever, that would have been a bingo card. And yet here we are. Um, yes, exactly. Here we are. Here this we is, are. This is beautiful. I was so happy to see that. That is amazing. And it's such a blessing because not only am I on it, but I'm able to choose when I want to be on. Oh, nice. Nice, 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 it nice. Went, it went from, okay, well, how about this, sporadically to... They send the schedule of available dates and times. Nice. And sometimes where there are cancellations, I have been very proud to say, no, I can't do that. Mm. And okay. unhealed me would continue to grab every opportunity because my belief in scarcity is that this is not going to happen again. That, that is, oh, that is a word. That is a word. Well, listen, Natasha, please tell us where we can find out more about Legalese, please, how we can join your community, where we can find you online. So the first place that I tell people to look is to go to Linktree and type in Natasha L. Robinson Esquire. If you go there first, there will be a pop up. And that window will say, hey, uh, you want to join my community? Another way you can reach me is by going to my website, www.legalleasepleased.com. Legalese Please is one word, and you spell legalese with a Z for zeal. And then I'm on all of the socials. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. You could connect with me in all of these different ways, LinkedIn, and it's all under Legalese Please. That's how you can connect. That's how you can support. You can look and see what I've done, what I'm doing, how you can help, because Legalese Please is more than just a business for me. It is a collective call to the community that we all can be. I think we're going to have a good time, and, and it's just going to continue to unfold. And I'm just glad that you gave me the opportunity to talk about what I love. Oh, my goodness. Thank you. I am so grateful for your time and for just the blessing of your story today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The Courageous Voice podcast is a collaboration between Connect.Faith and me, Shanda Rule. Music is by Ike Sturm and production by Jess Burchett. Thanks for listening.